Give you a moment of silence as a plea for priests to make confession of sin if necessary. Classroom etiquette. This is the second hour. So you've had proper preparation. Bring that problem to the Lord. Bring that trouble. Bring your troubled soul to him today. Let him give you proper instructions to encourage you, to admonish you, to teach you. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for your marvelous grace, your compassionate heart and a forgiving heart. We were told today in the first hour that that's the heart God wants in us. He's put the love there through the power of the Holy Spirit. He will give us the capacity for that love under all conditions to the maximum amount necessary under the spiritual growth momentum of the, of the spiritual life. The faith life. Oh, how we love Jesus. That's why we're here today, Father. Encourage our hearts not to let the world who evil allures us to be strong in our faith, in our walk. To take everything serious about God and not about the world. We've got it all backwards. We worry about the things we shouldn't worry about. And don't give a second thought about the things we should think about. Encourage our hearts today with a second message on the subject in Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. If you have your Bibles, if you'll open it to James, that's our study book on Sunday. James, we're looking at James, the first chapter. I want to go back and pick up from 12 to 15. And I want to talk about testing in the Christian life. This is part one of a two-part series. Blessed is a man, a person. Here's how... You're blessed. Blessed. I mean, that's, that's the maximum capacity that God has to give to maximum capacity to your soul. Now, he's not going to give you either blessing or testing beyond what you're capable of handling, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. But he is going to always reach your capacity. And to prove that he is God, he always goes a little over. And for some that have grown to a, a, a great capacity of spiritual growth maturity, they know what it means when he says the cup overflows. You, after a while, you, you forget how many cups that overflowed. You started with one cup, but it's been overflowing so much that I don't know if it's a, a gallon or a quart. And the difference in that, fill my cup, Lord, and the cup that overflows, Lord, is the difference in spiritual growth capacity. He's not going to give you. Fill my cup, Lord. So I don't pray fill my cup. I pray overflow it. I used to pray fill my cup. What's the difference? Well, the difference is my spiritual growth capacity. I have the capacity to fill it up and let it overflow. I want that overflowing now. I want that. I mean, I, I can't live without that. I don't, I'm not interested in just fill my cup anymore. Hmm? But you've got to have a cup to start with. <laughs> if you're saved, you have a cup. You toast every time you come in and you toast it in the Eucharist. That cup is the cup of the, of the blood of Christ. You have a cup. And he'll fill it. What you want is to reach that place of spiritual maturity with your walk with God where you want him to over, overfill it, overflow it. And 
and, and such blessings come to your life from it. Such blessings come to your life from it. That you just get happy in the Lord. You've been happy in the Lord? Happy in the Lord. Well, here we are. Blessed is the man who perseveres, who patiently endures. You remember that word, hupamone? Who perseveres under trial. For once he's been approved. You remember we studied these two words. There's two key words here. The word trial or testing or temptation. Perasmas. And that's testing to evaluate something, to assess the value of something by constantly pursuing it like an education. I often use this illustration because it makes sense to me. A person wanting to get go be a lawyer, and he goes through regular school, uh, pre-law, gets a degree, goes to law school, gets a degree. That's parasmas. That each evaluating towards a goal. Dokimas, this other word that's used for approved, is dokimas, and that means that you've gone to through parasmas. To reach a goal, and when you reach that, like going to law school, well, you got that. Now you've got to take the bar exam to be approved to practice law. That's dokimas. You went, you started out saying, I want to be a lawyer, and so you went through pre-law, then you went through law school. That's parasmas. That's moving towards a goal. And at some point, you're approved to actually practice you understand that? That would be with medicine or anything else. That's just, in my way, a good way of explaining these two words, meaning testing. Both these words come out under testing. But one is to assess a value and, the, and, and to move in that, that mind thought, and the other is being approved to actually practice what your goal was to be a lawyer. Well... Notice that these are the two words. Blessed is the man who perseveres, who patiently endures uh, perasmas, for once he's been approved, now watch. Once he's been approved, he will receive. In other words, he's out there and he's, he's living that law practice out. Then in the future, judgment seat of Christ, who this is undeserved suffering, he will receive the crown of life. The principle in this passage was that we know that from early, from James 1, uh, verses 2 through 4, or, or, or 8, actually. But he will receive the crown of life. The Lord has promised those who love him. Now, verse 13 and 14, where I am, uh, I'm in, I guess, 12 and 13 today. Let no man say when he is tempted, when you add, uh, when you see let on the front of word, that's a hortatory. Every time you see the word let in the English, that's a hortatory. And it, it, it's, a, it's suggesting, it's bringing a strong suggestion to you out of the word of God. Let no one say this. It, and, and the idea is there are those who say this, and it's just foolishness. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. Right? I am not I'm tempted. That's... And th this is a verbal form of parasmas, that's perazo. Eh? Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted. Watch, the word tempted is used four times. In this one verse, it's used four times. That's a dominant, isn't it? We call that a marker. That's a study marker. It's used four times. Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God. For, this is why no one, no one should ever say this. I am tempted by God because God cannot be tempted by evil and he himself does not tempt anyone. You understand that? And it means with evil. It's, it's not that God doesn't test you, but he doesn't test you with evil. God doesn't test you with bad things. You understand, God is good. The devil is evil, not God. 
All right. And so that, that's discussed. And then verse 14, but each, each man is tempted. There's, this, there's the word again. Then one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. And when lust is conceived, he gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Tonight, to, today in this lesson, I'm looking at verse 12 and 13. I'm looking at primarily 13. I'm looking at 12 that says, blessed is man who perseveres under trial. See, that's, that's perirasmas. And then that word is used again in verse 13 four times. Do you understand? Well, where's that? There's a contradiction here. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No, there's not one over here. He's persevering under trial. That's undeserved suffering. And who, he who patiently endures it to die in grace will save the crown of life. That's a positive. This whole thing is positive in his life. Agreed? Verse 13, but let no one say when he is tempted, which is verse 12, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone with evil. Okay? So we, we want to look at that subject matter today because it is this word, pirazo, that's used four times in this one verse, and that's a big marker. We call that a marker, and that's a big... One of those times, oh, look at four times, agreed four times? One time has the alpha privative on the front of it. It's parazo, but has an A on the front of it. See if you can find it. Let's go back to 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. See it? Now you got your, you got your uh, Greek? Which one? Which one has the A in front of it? A parazzo? Third one. Yep. Hey, you got you got the reward. Yep. Third one. So he's got one up there, two, three. For God cannot be tempted by evil. That's Right? So don't let anybody say when I am tempted by God doesn't tempt you with evil. You understand that? God doesn't tempt you with evil. He does not tempt you with evil. You need to be sure that you have that clear in your heart and your mind. So first thing I want to talk about today, well, here's what we're going to talk in the next two, two Sundays. There are five ways. Now look, look what I say. There are five ways, there are five ways that you can be tested in the Christian way of life. There are five ways. I'm going to show two of them today. Next Sunday, I'm going to do the other three. There are two. There are two ways you can be tested. The in verse 12, you can be tested by God. In verse 13, you can be tested by Satan. Because if you're tempted by evil, then it's the evil one tempting you, not God. All right? So let's look at the first one. The first area of your testing in the crystal, and look at verses 12, 13, 14, 15. 14 and 15, they go together. So you got verse 12, you got verse 13, 14 and 15 go together. So in our passage, which is James 1, 12 through 15, you have three of the five listed. Three of the five that I'm going to talk about, three of them. Now, I'm not going to get to 14 and 15 today, but I will bring that in next time and then finish this out. Okay? But I want you to see the five areas that you're tempted in, three of those areas are right here in this one passage. So I want you to be able to say, okay, three of the areas I'm tested in are right here in this one passage. Verse 12, I can be tested by God. Verse 13, I, can be, I, I, am, I am not tested by God with evil, but Satan does. And then the third, you can be tested by your own sin nature. I'll talk about that next week. But here's, here's verse 12. The, the first area of testing in the Christian way of life, textually, in our text, is by God. 
and it's to develop spiritual growth maturity. And out of that spiritual growth maturity, walking, see, look, here's undeserved suffering in your life. We've talked a lot about this now. But what, where does the crown of life come? It's being able to walk it out to the finish. Remember, it's always about finishing, isn't it? It's not how well you start. It's how well you finish that you get the crown of life. Undeserved suffering in your life, you patiently endure it because God has something better for you, right? It may not be in this life. It could be. It may not be in this life, but for sure it's in the next life. For sure. And how do I know that that's good? Well, the word of God says you're going to get it if it's undeserved suffering. Remember, there's four crowns. This is one crown. This is called the crown of life. You get for, for patiently enduring unto dying grace. Now, listen, it doesn't mean you have to go all the way. It just, listen, you're, you may be in undeserved suffering. It may be a month and it be gone. You got a month. It may be two months. Or like Paul, it may be a life. Once he put it on him, it was you got to walk it all the way out. Right? For Paul. And, and what did Paul learn? My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Right? See, there, you, it, and what's good about this is being able to see while you're walking this out in your life to the finish line, seeing how God blesses you with it. I mean, enormous ministry comes out of suffering for the person who embraces it, not the person who fights it, but the person who embraces it. Like Paul did, my grace is sufficient. Power is perfected in weakness. It had an enormous, enormous impact on Paul. And that, because it had enormous on Paul, and Paul had an audience, it impacted a whole lot of people, including Ron Adema. There's no passage I like more than 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, because it talks about grace, and I'm a grace guy. You know, the hardest thing about grace has not been learning it. It's been living it. The hardest thing about forgiveness is not receiving it. It's giving it. The hardest thing about compassion is not receiving it. It's giving it. Come on now. We know this. But you know where the blessing is? There's a light blessing on the receiving of it. But the greatest blessing is on giving it. The reward is always on giving, not getting. Hello? I just wondered. And if you'll hang in with God, he will teach you that principle. My wife always says, to me. It's more blessed, isn't it? In eternity, it's, it's not about what you get, it's about what you give. Eternity is about not what you get, it's about what you give. That's what it's going to come back, isn't it, Ron? And I said, you know, it sounds good to me. I think I've got, I think I believe that more today than I ever have in my life. Not about what I get from God, it's what I'm able to give out that has his name on it. I really believe that. I think she's got that one. I, I've learned a great deal about that from her. An area of testing in the Christian way of life by God is to develop spiritual growth capacity by the faith cycle, as we understand here. In Philippians 1.29, Paul wrote, one way, uh, Paul wrote, for you, for to you, it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but to suffer for his sake. Not a lot of ways to suffer. That's not my point. There, there, there are a variety of ways to suffer. But here's what you must know about it. Blessed, blessed is the person who patiently endures it. Who stays in the race. All you've got to do to win is finish. It doesn't say you have to be, it, how you fit, I don't care if you crawl across the finish line. <laughs> you got to finish. 
2 Timothy 4, 7, you have to finish the race. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 2. Finish the race that God has set before you, right? Patiently endure the race that God has set before you. There's no way. Listen, listen, let me ask you the first question. Do you believe Jesus died for your sin, was buried and raised from the dead third day? Just within your own heart, answer that. Then listen to what Paul said. It has been granted to those who believe in Jesus Christ to suffer in this world for his name's sake. Now, there's a lot of ways of suffering. But if you believe you're going to suffer for his name's sake, because you live in the devil's world. The devil is the God, little g of this world, the little g. He acts like a big one, but he's not. You know, like, like John 12, 31, he's the God of this world. Listen, it... It's a given. And listen, you're going to suffer in this world. Understand that. Understand it's a good thing. Understand that if it's for the sake of Christ, patiently endure. How can I do that? Grace, right? That's how Paul did it. My grace is sufficient for power is perfected in my weakness. Agreed? God's not going to, you're not going to walk this thing alone. He is going to walk you out. He's... Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. John 14, 16, the Holy Spirit's been placed inside your body forever. You don't have to do this alone, but you do have to do it. If that's the race set before you, you have to run it. You have to run it with what? Patient endurance. And where do I get that? Listen, I get that from the power of the Holy Spirit, and I get that because I know God is faithful to me. He will never put more on me than I can bear. But he will always put enough to fill my cup and overflow it. You need, you need to live to see God do that in your life where you stop doubting him. I love that song, fill my cup, Lord. Fill it up, Lord. You know how I sing that now? Overflow it. And listen, the more capacity you got, the more he flows it to you. If you got the capacity, he'll give you more suffering to give you more blessing. And for sure, when you walk around with that crown, I'll tell you, everybody else will go like, whoa. I had a shot at that thing, but I stumbled, fell, and didn't get up. You say, I don't know. Listen, <laughs> I taught this to my kids one time at home, a little home study with them. They were little bitty kids. And we didn't, the only place we ever ate when we went out was fast food cheap. That was a, that was a day out, or lunch out, or whatever we went. Whoever had the best specials where, I, where we went. We went to Burger King, and Burger King had come out with this goofy hat. Remember that goofy King's hat, the Burger King? They came out with that hat. And we went in there and got that goofy hat. And all my kids, we liked to, they liked to wore that thing out at home. They wore that all the time. And, uh, and I had just taught, you show you how God, this, God has a great sense of humor. I just taught that earlier about wearing crowns in eternity. And I did it really as simple as I knew how to do it to little bitty kids. Uh, and I thought they kind of would get that because they like to wear stuff, you know, play up. I'm the, this, I'm that, I'm queen for the day or whatever. So I went to Burger King, bought them, bought them these little stuff. They all got those hats and wore, wore those, those crowns. And I'll tell you, that was the cutest thing that they just talked about. I got my little crown. And I thought, you know what? Thank you, Burger King. Thank you, Burger King. Who would have ever thought that they could have gotten that lesson so well about crowns in eternity from a Burger King? They didn't get it from my lesson, apparently. 
<laughs> but Burger King helped me out through the crowns. And so every time I see those, those little goofy hats, I think about the lesson. I think about those kids walking, talking about they've, uh, they've got the crown. I got the crown. I got the crown. In Acts 14, 22, I love this passage. It's a missionary passage, Rick. It's a missionary passage. It says, strengthen the disciples and encourage them to remain true to the faith because we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. We have to go through many hardships. Got to go through many hardships. Now, it's not talking about salvation, right? He's talking about believers. He's talking about believers here. Listen, this is what Paul was saying when he said, you know, it's been granted for me to believe and to suffer for the sake of Christ until we meet him face to face. What a joy will that be when he hugs you and tells you, wow, did you do a job for me? Did you ever do a job for me? I thank you so much. That's what I think, anyhow. Those who believe... Those believers who finish the race set before them will receive the crown of life. They can receive 2 Timothy 4, 7, 8. They can receive the crown of righteousness. In 1 Peter 5, 4, they can receive the crown of glory. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 through 20 and Philippians 4, 1, they can receive the crown of boasting. These are all available to you. They're all available right there on your piece of paper. No reason. Listen, I want all my people to have a crown when you get there. <laughs> I want you all to have a crown. I'm going to get me one. I'm going to get me one. But you know, it's not because I entered the ministry. It's not because I spent 44 years faithfully in the ministry. It's because I finished my tour in the ministry. You understand that? Or I don't get the crown of glory. You got to finish the race set before you. Not because I did a few years. Because I did it dying grace. Now I've run too far. It's not how fast I run. Not looking to set any records. Not running to set records. I'm just running to fish to finish to get the prize. I want you to win. I want you to, I want you to do it as well. In Romans the fifth chapter, watch this now. On your piece of paper, Romans the fifth chapter, three through five. Listen to this very closely. Not only this, but we also exalt. This is the idea of praise God to glory in Him. To glory in God, not to have the glory of God in me, but to be able to give the glory of God back to him. So glorify is a wonderful word. On the front side, he glorifies me. On the back side, I glorify him. If I, if I grow in spiritual maturity, on the front side, he, he glorifies me. He gives me birth. He gives me, he gives me the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives me the Holy Spirit. He gives me two members of the Godhead. On the backside of my spiritual growth, I give him glory. I give him. Not only this, but we also, we ourselves also, praise God, exalt God in our tribulation. Watch how we do this now. Watch how we do this. In our tribulation, this is an interesting word. This is not the word for suffering. It is the word for different kinds of hardships. Hardships for the sake of Christ. Not just undeserved suffering, but hardships for Christ. This is a different category. It falls under the same ballpark, but it's a different idea. Notice the different Greek word. It's a different, different, and this involves different categories of hardships, not suffering as per se for the sake of Christ, but hardships for it. Let me give you an example of it. Go to your Bible. I'll show you an example of that. Go to 2 Corinthians 11 chapter with me. I'll give you an example of the difference. When we, Job went under suffering. Paul went under suffering. 
Paul also went under hardships for the sake of Christ. In, in 2 Corinthians 11 chapter, I may have put this on your paper. I did. Verses 23 through 28. Uh, he says uh, in verse 23, uh, am I a servant of Christ? He's been in this Syria. Am, uh, am I a Hebrew? I belong to Abraham, a servant of Christ. I speak as if it's saying, I, I so more. And the watch this. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death, five times received from the Jews 39 lashes, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times shipwrecked, one night and day I spent in the deep. I have, been, I have been on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger on the sea, danger among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship, there it is, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposed exposure, and apart from such external things called hardships, there is the daily pressure upon me concerning the churches. Look at that list. <laughs> That's called hardships. There are hardships. There are hardships. In, now, let's go back to the word tribulation on our paper. In our tribulations, see, what we shall exalt God. Now, watch the series. Now, the point is to exalt God, to praise Him, to glorify God when everybody says you ought to curse Him. Boy, if that's what it means to be a Christian, I don't want no part of that. Exult in tribulation, knowing, Oida, knowing that knowing, this is why you're in Bible study, knowing that the tribulations bring perseverance, perseverance, proven character. Listen to me now, I'm going to tell you something. This whole deal here is parasmas until we get to proven character. See that word proven character? That's dokimas. It's in a different form, but it's dokimas. It's an accusative. Dokimas. I'm going through hardships. Going through hardships. Going through hardships for the sake of Christ. Called tribulations. Which brings perseverance. And perseverance develops character. In other words, parasmas always is moving you towards dokimas, approval. You know what that is? Spiritual growth momentum. Which brings more glory to God in the angelic conflict and among the elect angels, if nobody else. But there is a chorus of witnesses. There are people in the stands watching you and your race. That's what Paul talked about in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verses 1 to 2. There's a lot of people, you don't even pay any attention to them. Got their eyes on you. Let me tell you, who really watching you? Those who are in your family, those who know you most. Tribulation, Tribu knowing that tribulation brings perseverance and perseverance brings proven character. And look what, look what proven character brings. When you come to Dokimas, where you are approved, it brings hope. But not just hope. Hope does not disappoint. It brings confident expectation in God. That God is greater. God, God can take my weakness and make power out of it, can make strength out of it. See, that's what Paul, that's that's at 2 Corinthians 12. He's 
developing power out of weakness. Power out of, listen, Peter, the, into this morning's lesson, Peter thought he was, I mean, in his mind, he had his own self-image. Al hit that absolute on the head, that he was this strong man, that, that he could carry the load, that he was more than willing, that he was capable, and, and he would never, never, and he was this, and he, he had a, a very good self-image in the flesh. It was phony baloney. Was it not phony baloney? Oh, he pulled the sword, but he wasn't supposed to. <laughs> he wasn't supposed to pull the sword. He's supposed to support Christ. Not deny me, support me. Listen, to, listen, in Matthew 16, Jesus said to him, you've become a stumbling block to me, Peter. You're standing in the way of the things that God wants me to do. You should be supporting me. You shouldn't be trying to hinder me. You should be supporting me. Peter never could wrap his brain around that. He thought he was doing all that. But it was all counter, counterintuitive and counterproductive. And even after Peter denied the Lord, still wasn't healthy. He was still broken. Broken is not bad unless you, unless you stay there. <laughs> God's always trying to break you down to get you up. Build a new person. Get rid of the old and bring on the new. But you got to listen, when you're broken, it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing because he wants a new man to come out. You know, you can have a wonderful egg and all of a sudden pfft, it cracks open and out comes a little chick. You go like, geez, I was going to eat that for breakfast. Now I'm going to have to wait a year not to eat it for lunch. I'm thinking like a farm kid, ain't I? Right? I mean, a lot of times we see the egg and don't see the chicken. A lot of times we see the one thing, don't see the other. That was Peter. He saw the one and couldn't see the other. Jesus said, you need to see the other. He couldn't do it. Why? Because it takes new man thinking. It takes new man thinking. I thought it was very interesting, and that's when he denied and he wept and did all that. He still wasn't healthy. He was broken and not healthy. When he was raised from the dead, in, Man, in, Luke the, in uh, Mark the 16th chapter, when, the, when uh, uh, Jesus meets the women and Mary, he says to them, I want you to go back and tell the disciples to, to meet me at, at, on the mountain. You know what he said? Listen to me. And he said, tell Peter. He said, tell the disciples I've risen from the dead and I want to meet him on the mountain. And then he said, see, I think he leaned forward and said to Mary, tell Peter. Now, why would he say, tell the disciples, and then say, tell Peter? He wants Peter to come out of his brokenness into a new man in Christ. It's a good thing that you're broken, Peter, because the old man is just a bag of bones. I want you raised from the dead, Peter! I want you to stand on your feet and hold your head high and be the man of God I've called you to be. That's what I think. And before he leaves this earth, he has a special meeting with Peter in John 21. He wants to be sure before he leaves this earth that that, that man Peter is healthy. And he goes through a lesson on health. Are you spiritual? Do you love me, Peter? Oh, Lord, you know I love you. No, you don't. That's not the love I'm looking for. That's old man love. That's old man talk. Do you got me, Peter? Do you agape me? Do you agape me? That's what I'm looking for, Peter. I'm looking for a healthy Peter. 
You're on the way, son, but you're not there yet. I wonder if Peter got that. Yep. Yeah, how do I know? I listened to him preach at Pentecost. The, the Peter at John 21 was not the Peter at Acts 2. I, I'm closing with this thing today, but that's who he wants us to be. It's not that we got broken. That's a good thing. It's what you do with it. All you've done is break a cycle of bad behavior. <laughs> I've been there and done that. Chose to do it a different way now. Don't sit around for four years trying to correct my life. I do it quickly. I do it quietly and quickly. I want to be that. I want to be the person that Christ died to save me. I want to be that person. I want to be the person that he has a self-image of, that the Lord has an image of who I want to be, that I should be. I want to be the man that he desires me to be. I want, to, want you to be the woman that he has an image about, not that you have an image about, but that he has one. I want you to grow into his image, not into yours. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way. I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would touch the messages heard today and the songs. Oh, how I love Jesus. I want to demonstrate that, Father, in the way I live my life, not just the way I sing and talk, but the way I walk. I want it to be for our church. I want it to be for those on the Internet that visit with us. I want to stop visiting and become a permanent part of it, to get into a system of study that will change their life and be able to deal with the things going on in their life in a very positive way. Blessed is the person who perseveres, for great things comes out of it when God is moving it. Not only will there be good things in time, but in eternity as well. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.